All right, let's get this party started. See what they've got lined up for the next new hero banner. See if it's going to be some attuned heroes or some... I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they'll bring a whole new... Oh, no! <laughs> okay. All right, so we're getting some engage going. Adorable artist Rosado. Going to have that flying axe unit here. Axe of Adoration. Wyvern Rift. Cuts damage from foes' initial attacks and hinders follow-ups too. Recovers after combat and can take many hits. Is that what that said? Can take many hits? Okay. Took some damage. Retaliate. Got that bonfire. And then attacking twice, okay. Alright. Onigiri Samurai. Kagetsu. Okay, so infantry sword unit. It's a tall order. Reversal Blade Plus. Wait, okay, so... That means he's going to be the four-star focus unit of the banner, which does mean we're probably going to get some sort of a special hero. I would think, right? Would make, Yeah, okay, here we go. Oh, rearmed, yeah. So we're going to get a rearmed hero. As the third hero. So does that mean we're also going to get... <laughs> a little charmer. Yeah, okay. All right. So Hortensia is going to be a flying, uh, flying cleric, flying staff user. Oh, that music. Beautiful. Arcane Charmer. Rescue plus Glitter of Light for the special. So it's going to be a special for uh, Glittering Anima for the C slot as well. Okay. Support and special. Give her an edge in battle. So she's going to have another uh, healing sp uh, healer special. Which is exciting. It's an exciting prospect. Always curious about those. And yes, we are going to get an attuned hero. Okay. So they are doubling up. I thought they were going to swap back and forth between rearmed and attuned, but... Oh, <laughs> Snow Queen. Oh, goodness me. That is going to be Ivy. Fan favorite. Flying Blue Tome Unit. Art by Kagage. She looks glorious. Icebound Tome and Luna. Obsession. Uh, okay, she also has Deadly Miasma. Okay, Soaring Echo. Uh, can soar to her support partner up to five spaces and attack three times. Her attuned skill. I missed it. Something about movement. Beautiful art for her. She looks great. Oh, I like that, I like that attack animation. It's very neat. Just that hail of... Uh, Flowery effects, very nice, very nice. And then AoE damage from the Miasma, of course. Okay. Imperial Blood, new story chapter. So, a full engage banner going on with not only not only a rearmed hero, but also a uh, an attuned hero. Was it, oh, I should have uh, checked if there was... I should have checked if there was going to be a new hero revealed here on the map. It doesn't look like it, so... I'm sure we are going to be getting some sort of a new hero, either a grand hero battle or uh, or something that's probably already revealed in game. But at least for the time for this for this uh, trailer, we don't know who that's going to be. So new hero banner starting on the 18th and would be going for about an entire month. Kagetsu is going to be the four star focus unit of the banner, of course, and then uh, it is going to be even color distribution across with the rearmed hero uh, being on the colorless and the attuned hero being on the blue. I guess their attempt to give more value to new hero banners by adding these uh, special hero classes in there that are limited by nature as well. So it, we're kind of we're kind of move, shifting away from new hero banners being you know completely dropped into the regular pool, and so attuned and rearmed heroes uh, are both again limited, and so so that does overall increase the value of new hero banners, but also decreases I guess the amount of value that's getting dropped into the regular pool. So it's a little bit of a you know a little bit of a double edged sword there, right? Um, but as far as the character selection, I think the character selection is great. I think uh, it's kind of about time that we got more in engaged characters in the game. 
game. And uh, these are certainly a set of fan favorites. Uh, Hortensia, I know a lot of people have been asking for. I'm certainly a big fan of Ivy. I'm certainly thrilled to see her have her actual uh, original incarnation in the game rather than just uh, the alt version. So uh, she didn't have to wait too long to get introduced. Um, although I guess this is technically an alt version. Like, it's she's a tune, but she's... You know, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> uh, so honestly, that's pretty hype. I think a lot of people are going to be excited for this banner, and I think rightfully so. We got Rosado as a flying axe unit. They, uh, they are going to have their own unique axe. Uh, 16 might, uh, at start of combat, killer slaying effect, and then if 25% HP at least gets uh, a boost to their stats, equal to X, where it's 16 minus the number of special cooldown count value times 2 min 8. Uh, if it was not equipped with a special, then X equals 8, okay? So it's at least 8, um, and then up to 16. It reduces damage from foes. First attack by 40%, so some damage reduction built in there, which is pretty nice. A grand special cooldown charge, plus 1 to unit per attack, and reduces percentage of foes non-special uh, by Y, uh, damage reduction by Y, if foes defense is greater than or equal to foes res, uh, at start of combat, Y equals 70, otherwise Y equals 30 uh, during combat and restore 7 HP to unit after combat. So a lot of these effects that we're seeing kind of um, carry over from banner to banner to banner. The health restoration, the damage reduction, the damage reduction reduction, all kind of scaling depending on certain stat checks that are happening, as well as an overall stat boost with a min 8 uh, max 16 based upon the actual cooldown value that they have and then killer slaying effect too so lots of really good stuff in that axe uh, bonfire for the special earthwind boost three for the a slot uh, hp plus three uh, if at least 50 percent hp grants plus seven to speed and defense during combat and also if unit is within two space of an ally with uh hp of at least 50 percent inflict special cooldown charge minus one on foe per attack during combat. So a big guard effect on the enemy. Wyvern Rift for the B slot. So this one's going to inflict attack defense minus four on foe during combat. And if unit speed plus defense is greater than or equal to foe speed plus defense minus 10, uh, excludes effects from Phantom, unit deals X uh, plus X damage, excluding when damage uh, dealing damage with an area of effect special and reduces damage from foes first attack by X during combat where X equals the unit's defense at the start of combat minus 35 min 0 max 7 <laughs> okay uh, first attack normally only means right but if it's a brave effect it is actually both of them um, unit makes a guaranteed follow-up attack foe cannot make a follow-up attack and increases the speed difference necessary for foe to make a follow-up attack by 20 during combat Speed must be greater than or equal to 25 to make a follow-up attack. Stacks with similar skills. Phantom is, if a skill effect compares a unit stat to a foe stats, treats unit stats as if granted plus X. All right, so there's a lot of stuff packed in there. Uh, I think at a base level, right, it's going to give attack defense minus four on the enemy during combat. So at a base level, there is that in-combat debuff. There is this speed plus defense check against the enemy as well. And then what really feels like a very needlessly complicated calculation uh, to calculate X, uh, which scales off of Rosado's defense. So it's just like de the defense stat minus 35, and then that equals the X stat, and the X stat is a, a max of seven or a min of zero. So, I mean, I guess you could just really think of it as zero, as like seven. I mean, I'm saying it's needlessly complicated because the max value is seven. So seven is, it's fine, it's decent, but it's not absurd. And so they really could have just said like, give seven damage or do an additional seven damage and reduce damage by seven instead of like having the scaling off of defense or they could have just made it much much simpler to just simply scale off of defense without this like minus 35 just meet a certain defense threshold or something i just sometimes i don't really understand the needs to jump through these hoops it feels like they're like deliberately making it complicated so you have to like stare at the skill and, and in order to figure out if you're going to get the max value um but yeah so there's damage reduction built in there you know the unit makes a follow-up guaranteed follow-up attack the foe can't make a follow-up attack increases the speed difference in order for them to make a double which all right so it's kind of logically thinking through this i feel like this element of the skill is intelligence systems trying to create a counter to those units that are very common now nowadays 
that prevents that nullifies skills that prevent units follow-up attacks right so we have as part of wyvern rift it actually foe cannot make a follow-up attack we have so many skills out there that nullify that and then you know th then the unit will just naturally double if they have enough speed so this is their way of adding another failsafe check to have uh, have them have to meet you know over 20 it, it's basically another way to kind of artificially negate the enemy's ability to double attack when they can naturally double it's a, I, I know i kind of was going around in circles there a little bit but basically it, to me it's it's kind of like the counter to the counter to the counter which to me feels kind of messy i guess it's the, their way of attempting that but it's going to have value at least in terms of nullifying generally um, enemies' abilities to naturally double. So that, that's going to have value outside of that scenario as well. Uh, so next up, we've got Kagetsu. Again, an infantry uh, sword unit. Poor Kagetsu. Uh, <laughs> getting dropped into a very, very competitive pool. And not only that, being the four-star focus unit, um, but he is going to come with Reversal Blade Plus, Inheritable Sword. Uh, if unit is initiates combat or is within two space of an ally, grants plus four to all stats, and inflicts penalty on foe's uh, stat line, all of their stats, during combat, equal to the bonus on each of foe's stats times two. Uh, calculates each stat penalty independently. Uh, if foe has plus seven, then they get attack minus 14 for a net penalty of minus seven. So, all right, so as far as inheritable swords go these days, not terribly remarkable. It's it's okay. It's all right. It's effectively nullifying and, and uh, inflicting debuffs and stat boost. It's a stat differential change. I mean, that's really all it is. There's no other kind of... Um, uh, embellishments to what the or utility to what the sword brings and so therefore it really is just kind of as simple as you know a stat boost nullification as well as debuffing and buffing of himself which is is just okay uh, moonbow for the special attack speed ideal three for the a slot and null follow up three for the b slot um so unfortunately nothing really to get too excited about with this kit uh, he's got some stepping stone skills and things like that but otherwise again nothing too special all right so next up we've got hortensia who is going to be a flying staff user and so she is going to have an inheritable uh, rearmed staff arcane charmer 14 might uh, has a killer slaying effect. Max cooldown count cannot be reduced below one. Makes sense. Restore seven HP to allies within three spaces of unit after their combat. Ah, okay. At start of combat, if unit's HP is at least 25%, grants plus five to all stats. Uh, unit makes a guaranteed follow-up attack. Grants special cooldown charge plus one to unit per attack during combat. And deals plus seven damage during combat. Um, so just fixed damage built in there. So, so that is pretty decent as far as an inheritable staff goes. You have some passive healing and utility built in there. You have fixed damage, a killer slaying effect, as well as a stat boost, a guaranteed follow-up attack. You have basically a blade effect built into there too. So it is really kind of centered around her guaranteed follow-up attacks as well as proccing her special, it's, it seems like, um, which, is, which is all good things. So, so it does certainly seem like she's going to be more focused on the offensive side of things rather than being strictly support. And her support effects are nice she gives her allies the ability to restore their own health through attacking uh, but beyond that nothing like nothing terribly special our rescue plus for the assist glitter of light for the special all right so three cooldown when special triggers boost damage by 45 percent of foes res calculates damage from staff after combat damage is added uh, if this special is triggered during combat, after combat, inflict status on target and foes within two spaces of target, preventing counterattacks through their next action. Okay, alright, that is actually quite good. Not only is that a nice little chunk of damage, 45% of foes res, potentially, right? Um, but also that whole uh, debilitating the enemy to prevent them from counterattacking to not only the target, but allies within two spaces. That, you know, that would obviously synergize very well with a Deadly Miasma, which uh, she doesn't have. She has her own unique C-slot skill. We're going to have to see what that is. But really, it's going to effectively allow uh, her allies to kind of clean up the mess. Whoever's left over, you know, presumably you're going to want to get that kill on whoever you're initiating against. But as far as the allies are concerned, you know, if you do some residual damage, you have a debuff on them, anything like that, uh, the ability to just prevent their counterattacks straight up is a very potent thing. So... Um, quite, you know, quite useful, I would say, for sure. Uh, attack speed catch 4 for the A slot, Poetic Justice for the B slot makes a lot of sense for an offensive healer. Now, what I will say, something interesting about the Arcane Staff is that it doesn't have any uh, either Dazzling or Wrathful effect built into it, right? 
So that that is a little odd. That does mean that, you know, obviously the Wrathful component is built into the B-slot poetic justice that she has, but that does mean that she doesn't have a free reign to just attack in with a dazzling effect. So that, you know, the Glitter of Light bestows that, but only after she attacks. So that means in the initiation, she can actually be counterattacked, uh, which is, that's an interesting move. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't give the uh, the rearmed healer, an arcane weapon for a staff unit, uh, one of those built-in effects of a dazzling or a uh, or a wrathful. It does. I mean, it certainly does balance things. I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad move, um, and I don't think she necessarily needs it either. It's just it's just an interesting observation. And then glittering anima for the C slot at start of turn. If unit's HP is at least twenty five percent, attack speed plus six, Kanta one, and the following status to unit and allies within three spaces of the unit for one turn. A neutralizes penalties on unit during combat. That's very nice. At start of turn, if unit's HP is at least 25%, inflict speed res minus 6, panic, and discord on closest foes and any foe within 3 spaces of those foes through their next actions. If unit is within 3 spaces of an ally, grants attack speed plus 3 to unit and neutralize effects that inflict special cooldown charge minus X on unit during combat. Okay, alright. Uh, so obviously Glittering Anima is her own unique uh, unique skill, and it's quite a skill. It's got a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, basically, as soon as she, as long as she meets that 25% HP threshold, she gets all of these buffs on herself and her allies, the Kanto, the neutralizing penalties, and then on the enemy, inflicting a stat debuff on them, Panic, Discord, um, and then furthermore, just getting an, an additional buff to herself, uh, an in-combat buff if she's within spaces of an ally, in addition to the neutralization of the guard effect on her, which uh, is, is or any guard effect on her, which is hand-in-hand -hand with her whole, um, her whole MO of trying to proc her special. I mean, that really does seem to be kind of for the driving factor of what she, what her game plan is, is, is being offensively oriented, proccing her special, um, having all of those debuffs on the enemy, buffs on her allies, allowing them to kind of clean up everybody else when they can't even counterattack is kind of like the whole thing. So uh, she's gonna be she's gonna be a tricksy one. And then her weapon as well, quite quite nice, has a lot of very nice stuff built into it, especially for uh, an inheritable weapon, right? So here we have Ivy. Obviously she looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, so she is going to be a flying uh, blue tome unit and she is also going to be an attuned hero apparently. Um, yeah, so I don't know if there's necessarily a rhyme or reason to who they're picking as attuned heroes versus rearmed heroes. It, it kind of seemed like, it seemed like at one point rearmed heroes and attuned heroes were going to be specific variant types of, like, original versions, like, elevated in some way or evolved in some way, but I, I feel like that's not really, uh... They haven't really stayed true to that, so it feels like kind of like anybody that they want, they just kind of like make an attuned hero or a rearmed hero. To be fair, uh, I guess from a rearmed hero perspective, we got Alfred like super early, so they kind of like squashed that theory very, pretty early on anyway. But um, but that that being said, um, we've got Ivy here. I, she looks amazing, um, and obviously she's a fan favorite character, and I, I personally am a big fan of her design as well. Uh, and she's in a tune, so she's going to have a lot of built-in value just, just therein. And she's also going to be a flying blue tome unit, which... I love me some flyers, so that's certainly up my alley as well. All right, so Icebound Tome, 14 might, killer slaying effect. If unit is on a team with a with unit support partner, uh, unit can move to a space within two spaces of any support partner within three spaces of unit. Uh, if unit is not on a team with their support partner at the start of turn, unit can move one extra space. That turn only does not stack. If unit initiates combat or foe's range is two, Grants plus X to all stats to unit, where X is 25% of foe's attack at the start of combat, minus 4, max 14, min 5. Uh, neutralize effects that inflict special cooldown charge, minus X on unit. Reduces damage from attacks during combat by percentage equal to 20, plus number of spaces from start position to end position of whoever initiated combat, max 5 times 10, excluding AoEs. And if unit deals damage with follow-up attack, restores 7 HP to unit, uh, triggers even if 0 damage is dealt. I gotta say, that's a little, that's a really weird one at the end there, that she needs to do a follow-up attack in order to get the 7 HP. But I, I have a feeling that's gonna have to do with one of her other skills and a gimmick, because I remember as part of the description that they gave for her, like, they said she attacks three times or something, so... But if we break it down, the tome is very good. It's got a killer slaying effect, it has that whole support partner uh, gimmick uh, tied to it, but then if you don't have a support partner, she just gets an, a, an additional extra movement space, which 
is amazing. So either either she has insane warping capability of being able to warp basically five spaces away, and then of course having a range of two, so she can reach all the way across the map. But um, even if she doesn't have that and doesn't have a support partner available, she's also just going to get an extra space to move, uh, which is again inherently very very good to have. Um, no other you know requirements or anything. She just gets that. Um, and then of course she gets the stat boosts as well, which again has a relatively convoluted calculation associated with it. Um, but more or less, it's a max 14 min 5, and it scales off of the foe's attack. So it's 25% of foe's attack during combat, uh, which is, you know, that's quite nice, uh, definitely. To all of her stats, getting a plus 14 to all stats, it's very good. Uh, and then, of course, she's got some damage reduction built in there with this calculation based upon the amount of movement. So it's a maximum value of 5 for the position, right, for the actual movement, times 10, which would be 50, plus 20, which would be 70. So she can get a maximum value of 70% damage reduction, always. Like, the condition being, if the enemy has um, a range of 2 or if she's initiating. But other than that, it seems like she always gets either 20% or 70% damage reduction, depending on how much movement uh, actually transpired. So that that's quite a lot, and that is quite a lot of damage reduction. And the, again, the healing uh, upon follow-up attack. So uh, let's see what her, her A slot is. She has Luna for the special. So Obsession. Obsession for the A slot. At start of combat, if unit's HP is at least 25%, grants plus 9 to all stats to unit during combat. Unit makes a guaranteed follow-up attack. Foe cannot make a follow-up attack. And also when unit performs a follow-up attack, neutralizes, reduces damage by X percent effects from foe, non-special skills. All right, so straight up damage reduction nullification is on her follow-up attack. So, for whatever reason, she just gets a lot of things on her follow-up attack. And she has a guaranteed follow-up attack built into Obsession. But upon follow-up attack, uh, she gets that healing from her weapon, and then she also uh, neutralizes damage reduction straight up. Which, again, is something that, I, like I mentioned before, is a little bit rarer. I mean, we see a lot of damage reduction reduction lately, not so much damage reduction nullification. So, um... It is tied only to her follow-up attack, but that is really good these days, just straight up nullifying damage reduction, even if it's tied to a follow-up attack, if, especially if you can get a desperation effect on her, I, th that's that's real good. Um, so at start of combat, if unit's HP is twenty five, at least 25%, and if decreasing the speed difference necessary to make a follow-up attack by 25 would allow unit to trigger a follow-up attack, uh, excluding guaranteed or prevented follow-up attack, trigger potent follow X% percent during combat if unit cannot perform follow-up and attack twice x equals 80 otherwise x equals 40 okay i have to I, I can't remember what potent follow x percent is i have to look that up oh right okay so potent follow x percent is is just a it's a follow-up to the follow-up so it's basically a brave effect for the follow-up attack right it triggers an additional follow-up attack immediately after the unit's standard follow-up attack and deals damage equal to x percent of unit's normal attack damage as well okay Right, right. So that that is going to effectively give her the ability to do a brave effect for her follow up attack. She's going to get a successive additional follow up attack that um, that do deals either eighty or forty damage, depending on whether or not the actual follow up could have been performed um, and attacked twice. Yeah. So okay. So she just gets a third, yeah, as the description said, she gets a third attack from the potent follow up percent, uh, which I guess also gets the other effects since it counts as a follow up attack, like the damage reduction nullification and the healing. I'm actually not 100% on that. I think that's what that how that works. Well, we can take a look at the actual interaction again um, in the in the trailer. Uh, attack rest far trace four for the B slot uh, has a Kanto remainder minimum one. Uh, inflicts attack rest minus four on foe during combat and units deals plus seven damage, including when dealing damage with a special triggered before combat. So that's quite nice. That fixed damage is a, a nice addition to that. Deadly miasma for the C slot as well with that divine vein haze. Uh, as well as the neutralization to foes' bonuses and the uh, the actual in-combat debuff on the enemy as well, which is quite nice. And then Soaring Echo for the attuned slot. So, infantry and flying allies within two spaces can move to a space within two spaces of unit. So that does allow her to effectively act as a beacon uh, for infantry and flying allies. All right, so I'm, I'm liking what they're putting down with, with attuned Ivy here. I think she's got some really great stuff. Her tome is very... It, it's got it covers basically everything along with obsession and I, I think the whole damage re reduction nullification is is a pretty big deal the stuff I, I think it's interesting that they tied a lot of things to her follow-up attack I do like that they're thinking outside of the box a little bit with the whole like follow-up attack and basically a lot of tying a lot of things to her follow-up attack 
So uh, yeah, let's just see. Let's just see here how it how it works. So she's gonna be attacking, and then yep, boom, boom. She gets right. Okay, and then she attacks a third time. She healed from the follow up attack, and then she's gonna get a third follow up attack, which is going to be forty percent, I guess, of the attack. And then yeah, okay. All right, so uh, that 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 does make sense. Um, so yeah, really powerful. I mean, again, we've only recently gotten the sort of lodestar uh, effect, you know, in the game, and so Ivy is going to be another kind of uh, another hero that will have that effect built into her kit in some way, shape, or form. Um, so that is certainly powerful. And as far as the attune slot, I, I think what she's got is quite nice. Being a beacon to in increase the warping maneuverability of her allies is uh, really powerful and honestly like really dangerous to see on the enemy forces too. So it, it's a relatively scary skill to see um, for sure. Just just to have, especially especially since it's an, an attuned it's since it's an attuned slot skill. I mean, especially since it's inheritable, right? Uh, you could try to procure a number of copies of attuned ivy and then bestow that uh, that slot to a number of allies, flying allies or infantry allies on your team. Probably it's probably locked to flying allies. Um, but I mean that that's just such a dangerous thing to have on all of your team to have all that warping capability it's it's quite scary uh, presumably you are going to be able to spark on this banner as well yep up to two times so there are two uh, limited heroes right attuned IV and rearmed Hortensia and both of them are you are going to be able to spark for uh, by going up to the 40th summon so that it's it's good value it is definitely a, a high value. Uh, overall, and honestly, I'm I'm tempted to summon on this one. I am, uh, if for no other reason than I just kind of want Ivy. Um, I think in general she's got some really great stuff too. Um, as far as her attuned skill, I think it's going to be very good. I could kind of take it or leave it personally, just because I, I think that because I feel like they're going to get really crazy with the attuned skills. To be perfectly honest, like they've already shown their They've already kind of shown their hand. They've already kind of shown that they're willing to just kind of like leapfrog skills over and over again uh, with within just a couple of banners of each other. And I feel like the attune slots, like we haven't seen anything yet. I think they're going to go nuts with them in the future. Um, so I think there's a lot of like potential just out there for what they're going to plan on doing. Uh, Rearmed Hortensia as well, very, very good. I think, I think generally speaking, um, and it's no surprise, both of the limited heroes are really the stars of the banner. Uh, I think Kagetsu is certainly suffering from being the four-star focus unit of the banner and also being an infantry sword unit, uh, not not bringing a whole heck of a lot to the table. Um, Rosado certainly very good too. I, I think that they're also a, quite a nice pickup from this banner. But I, I, again, I think that just the Attune and the Rearmed have so much going for them at this point and so much innate value. Value. Also being limited just ends up kind of, you know, pushing them up a couple ranks. So, all right. So those are my first impressions for the new heroes, a banner that features a tuned ivory and a rearmed Hortensia. Uh, as far as my summoning, I, I don't, I'm still in saving mode just because, you know, I mean, legendary Camilla, right? So she's going to circle back at some point. And then um, Hero Fest, of course, prospectively will have her, maybe, I, I'm hoping, I, th I think it's a good chance, um, but we won't know until we know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. Maybe we'll go in a bit for this. Maybe we'll go even up to the spark just to guarantee Ivy. I'm not sure. But uh, let me know down below if you guessed this banner, if you're excited for the banner, who you're going to be going for if you are. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed the video. If you did, please feel free to leave us a like, comment, subscribe to the channel for more Fire Emblem Heroes content. We thank you all so much for watching, for taking time out of your day to spend with us. We really do appreciate it. And until next time, let's protect those skies.